You're watching convention coverage on site.
Uh, they burned their Bolton kingdom. But I listened to this so much that I could, I could sing along with it. And, you know, 2006, flash forward, Marco sadly had passed away and they were looking for someone that could sound like him. And I have literally been, unbeknownst to me, working on a Marco impression for 30 years. Is that great? So, yeah, so that's how that happened. And you know what, sometimes think, I think, wow. You know, and when you get a little older, you can sort of look back at the string of things and how this led to that. And I think at the time, it was, it was just another album, and I probably got three or four or five, I don't remember. What if they hadn't gotten me that album? You know, I thought, wow, you know, if I had never received that album, none of this would have happened to me, and it would probably be somebody else sitting here right now. So it's, you know, it's sort of interesting. I think there's a, uh, a lyric in the show, Pacific Overture, that Sondheim wrote, called, uh, It's the Ripple, Not the Stream. And that's sort of what it is. Steve Tomlin writes a show. He puts Marco in it. He, I, he and has no idea that I end up being one of the ripples. You know, this this 17 year old kid in Texas. Yeah. Anyway, that's great. Pardon me for my ignorance. Did you just mention Stephen Sondheim? I did mention Stephen Sondheim. He wrote this musical. He wrote Pacific Overtures. He did indeed. What is it called? Please? Pacific Overtures. In fact, it was wow. Hell. It was really. I mean, what I loved about it. This was like it was like nothing else. The musicals. Up to that point, except for Sondheim, it's been pretty much boy meets, you know, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. This, man, the whole musical is done kabuki style, in a heavy makeup, and in kabuki style, all the women's roles are also played by men. Very, very Japanese. And it's about how the Americans came in 1853, and this previously alienated society was opened up. And as the show progresses, it becomes more and more Americanized and actual women start appearing in the show, and the music becomes more Americanized. And not, and not necessarily in a good way, which to me I thought was also interesting, because I think in the same decade they were doing George Ann with these patriotic musicals, and here was this musical that was really dealing with geopolitics in a way that had not been addressed before. And anyway, you know, I'm a big fan. Quick story, I'm sorry about that. I, I wanted to thank Stephen Sondheim, an actor, Albert Finney, whom I loved, and was instrumental in me becoming an actor, he died. And I was going, wow, I, I wish I had told him when he was alive. And my wife said, well, you know, Mako's not around, but Stephen Sondheim is, you should write him a letter. So I did. I wrote him a letter telling him exactly how this all happened and thanking him for what he had done. And to my shock and amazement, about a month later, he wrote me back. And he said, you know, the, the letter said, Greg, I'm so happy to know that this show had such a salubrious effect on your life. And because he used the word salubrious, and I was, this is Stephen Sondheim. You know, this has got to be Stephen Sondheim. So there you have the story. That's a great story. That's cool. Joe, you have the unfortunate opportunity of following that. Yeah, it's not going to be nearly as interesting as a story, whatever it is. But, well, Okay, I think we'll start off with the fact that you're an Air Force then. I am indeed. You spent uh, how many years in the Air Force? Ten. And as a pilot? No, as an intelligence officer. Okay, but you are a pilot, right? I you do fly, fly yeah, but uh, only small, dangerous... The best part? Yeah, small, the dangerous aircraft. Well, come on. You're also an author. Yes. What, talk, talk a little bit about your book. Uh, I kind of took my military experience and I wrote a series of books very loosely based on this, kind of like satirizing my military experience called the Epic Failure Trilogy which is like sci-fi military humor. People call it like a, a Terry Crouching in space. That's, that's the long line. Okay. And it's a trilogy? How far it is a trilogy. It was finished in 2019. There's audiobooks. I read them because I'm uh, narcissistic. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, there's, they, they've been out for a long time now. I'm not working on anything right now, so I think that's, uh, I think I'm, it's a pause on writing for me. But turning on a couple novels is fun. So I noticed, if you look at his IMDb page, he had, I think I counted 21 roles since 2000. It's been a, yeah. <laughs> there's a, you know there's a pandemic, right? It's yeah. It's easy to find work right now. It's been odd. Uh, I'm actually relatively new to voice acting, I mean, compared to the rest of the, the table. Uh, I started in 2013 as like a corporate voice actor, and I didn't even get to LA until 2015. So I'm not that far into my, in my career yet, but it's been a wild ride. Uh, it's been great. So let's talk a little bit, and we'll, we'll get your questions ready. Start thinking about what you want to ask, and we'll get to them. And just remind me, everybody have masks on, please, if you can. Um, talk a little bit about voiceover right now. What are you doing? And Because a lot of the stuff, you're not actually going into, if you're working out, you're not going into studios. You're doing it from home, right? Yes. 
Yeah, please. Go ahead, Terry. Oh, well, yeah, I guess uh, agreeing. Uh, home studios have been, uh, you know, uh, well, they've saved the voice business and saved those who were producing. Uh, you know, like people who were making books and so on and so forth. Then we, we can work right out of our uh, our houses. It's beautiful. You wear flip-flops, shorts. If you're lucky. If, if you want to. If you want to. That's a formal thing. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's great fun. And I'm kind of a... I, I came up in radio, I, I did a lot of radio, and I've always been, I love microphones, just the design of them, and, you know, the, how they work, and uh, uh, so I now have a nice collection of my own, and I, I use different mics for different jobs. I just finished a book for Audible, and it was, uh, I think it's going to be seven hours, so you can imagine how many hours recording of that it took. And I can honestly sit here and say, I have no idea what it's about. I feel I understand you completely. I've done a lot of long form stuff. I've done like a lot of like, corporate e-learning and stuff that's like that. It, that's it. And I'll get to the end of the thing and I just did like, you know, two hours on uh, fluid dynamics. And I'm like, I have no idea. I couldn't teach fluid dynamics. You know, like, whatever. Well, I should have done that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Fluid dynamics, so you got me beat. This is a business-to-business uh, -business kind of a, he's a motivational guy. And he's a very, very smart man, but they salespeople in, in those books, the way they're structured, they have a tendency to repeat and repeat. You know, it's called the two by four effect. Hits you between the eyes with a two by four until you, you get it. Uh, and that's what the, that's what I spent the past uh, few months doing. Do you wake up in the morning reciting pieces of it like? No, no, because nothing sticks. I I couldn't tell you one thing. Probabilistic. I use that a lot. <laughs> Probably it's a great word. Probably is a good word. I'm going to use it more myself. Yeah. It's lubrious. 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 Now that's a great word. That's a great word. And I don't, I don't mean, to, I'm not demeaning anybody. I, I, God bless them. And uh, good for me. I got to do the book. It's my first for Audible. Uh, well, actually, I did one back in uh, around 2004. Uh, but I hadn't done any in the interim. And it was. Uh, you really have to get in harness, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's get up and go to work. Even though it's in your own house, you still have to get up and do it. And for those, for those sorts of jobs, like you're not, do you create a character in those, or are you like a natural well, man? No, you know, in this, this case, this was straight pitch. Just me. I, I did a couple of dialects. Three words. But no, it's, it's very, for that reason, I did not enjoy it. You know, I was hoping, boy, Audible, I'll get to do fiction. And I get this sales book. Suck it up, do it, hope for the best. It's like a check for you. Yeah, a check for you. Yeah, that's a check for you. And Greg, what about you? I know you're not only are you doing reads and such like that, but you're also doing Cameo, right? You know, Cameo has really, it's a, surpri it's a surprising thing. It's really helped me through the pandemic. Because of the very nature of Iro, more and more, I, I, as things started getting more and more serious, as opposed to simply, hi, you know, can you wish me a happy birthday, you know, we're getting married, you know, that sort of thing was usual. It became more and more about, you know, Uncle Iroh, please just tell me it's all going to be okay. And as I started to do that, and I, you know, as Uncle Iroh, it also helped me think that, okay, everything is going to be okay, don't be so... Again, the, the, the line from Uncle Iroh that I, I, it keeps coming back to me again and again and again. So my favorite line is, if you look for the light, you can often find it. If you look for the dark, that is all you would ever see. And as we get more and more into the pandemic, and this happened more and more, that was a source of light for me. You know, just to, just to be able to, I mean, honestly, obviously I'm making money off of it, but by helping other people, I was helping myself, I guess. So that, that to me, has been the great gift of Cameo during this, these odd times in which we find ourselves. And hopefully we will get through soon. And maybe the next time we can all see each other's smiles, you know, which would be kind of awesome. You know, and maybe I can breathe again. I'm hyperventilating inside of <laughs> I, I will tell you, now, did anybody watch back last year, I guess it was last year, where we did uh, Stockton Con Online? Everybody get a chance to watch Greg, so I believe that's still online. But I, I, I'll, I'm just going to share. You know, Greg made that comment last year, and I had the privilege of moderating. 
and my wife at the time was you know, going and having some family issues and stuff like that. So she was watching it in the next room and just to see what I was doing. And she heard him say that. She knew nothing of Umbar, nothing at all. And but she was like, Oh my god, that was so moving. So well, you know, she was so That's excited. Not, I don't know, you know, thank you to the writers of I think that line from Life in the Forest. The writers wrote that. Uh, but you know, that's that's Iro. Iro is, is he has transcended just an animated character. He has literally impacted people's lives. Time and again, people come up and they say, wow, I was going through this, or I was going through that, and Iroh said this thing, and it helped me. And, you know, what a privilege and an honor. You know, I, I have to admit, people sometimes expect me to be as wise as Iroh. And, you know, I'm, I'm just as, I've, I've been around the planet a while, but I'm no more wise than anybody else that might have just been on this planet for 61 years and was just paying attention. Uh, but it, again, it, it, it is, uh, Iro has helped other people and he, and he helps me even now. You know. All right, so who's got a question? Anybody have to raise your hand? Please stand up and uh, ask a question. You just address it then. I will do my best to repeat it or they will we'll figure it out. Okay. Hey, hey, that's so loud. <laughs> Okay, my question was about the future of voice acting. Because I've been doing things for a lot of animated, or bigger animated, uh, serious stuff. For they produce like Marvel and Disney that they start using celebrities in the place of voice acting. Do you think that's going to start affecting the voice acting industry as a whole? So that's, that's where we're going with this panel now. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Let, me, let me tell you something, young man. That, that left the, uh, yeah. That left the terminal a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, like, I personally have been straight up replaced on five different projects, uh, like after production, uh, to be swapped with a celebrity. Um, it sucks, but it's part of the industry, uh, and it's not going away. And I think particularly for feature film, and now, in a large part, for AAA video games. Like, that's kind of where it's going. So, you just gotta have to deal with it. Like, I, I can't, I can't become you know, Chris Pratt. Like, I just can't. I have to deal with it. I, should, I can I can work on what I can work on, which is being really good at what I do in the booth, and that's it. I can't work on being famous. Amen. Good for you. You can, you can blame, actually, when you think about it, you can blame Aladdin and Robin Williams for that. Because when you really think about it, it looked like a Beauty and the Beast, for example, Disney's Beauty and the Beast. There were no major celebrities. Mm -hmm. But once they went with Robin Williams and Aladdin, then they were doing Mel Gibson and Pocahontas, and they were, then, yeah, it's, it's that train left the station. It's, yeah. It is what it is. Is it, is it in fact, that the pandemic made it even easier since, uh, like you said, they can go from their bedroom to their living room in four days and never have to leave the house, and that way you've got time to make something for two hours work? Well, I think he still gets paid the same amount. So, I mean, like, just from, like, a union perspective, like, he would get paid the same amount, right, whether he was in his underwear in his home or in, you know, in an actual studio. But I don't have to fly in somewhere. I don't That's true. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. For me, it depends on whether or not you, you, you're working solo. For example, if you're doing a video game, you're, you're by yourself no matter where you are. Yeah. But uh, DuckTales, Darkwing Duck, back in, the, in the, those days, uh, you, you sat around uh, like a chamber orchestra. You know, with the little green visors and microphones and people talked and sipped coffee and went out to lunch together. It was a real nice social affair. They are the most fun sessions I've ever had as ensemble yeah. cast recordings. The yeah. most fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, but but, but that, that's not on the table right now, obviously. And so being able to go to your, uh, again, your, wearing your flip-flops into your... Uh, a friend of mine, uh, I, I was teaching voice and she said, what would be a, how, how expensive for a home studio? And I said, and I kind of had a feeling about her. I said, do you have a walk-in closet? She said, yes. And that, was, that became her studio. The baffling is unbelievable. It's perfect. So if you have a walk-in closet, maybe you can rent it out. <laughs> Like, what do you think of the voice acting, but if people can still keep There's plenty of work, don't get me wrong. There's tons and tons and tons of work. Are you going to be the lead character in a Disney feature film? Probably not. Yeah, Even, it doesn't matter how great of a, uh, an actor you are, a voice actor, probably not. Well, can we, let, let's get into that a little bit. How, what's the best, what's his next step? He's got a voice, he can do characters. What, how do you guys 
take a character or get a role or get something, and what would you suggest for him getting in, taking that next step? Like, uh, okay, before they start, I was going to say, it's a bit different from person to person, I'd say. You know, I built my career in a completely different way from most people. I guarantee you it's completely different from these two gentlemen. So, yeah. You know, for me, I would say, uh, you really want to... Work on your Mako impression. I think that's, you know. All right. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, like, my path was I worked for the Air Force as an intelligence officer and stumbled into voice acting in 2013, quit my job eight months later, moved to LA, and then that was it. Well, how, but how do you stumble into voice acting? I was, what was that path? Okay, so to paint the picture, I was on reserve duty because I was still an Air Force reservist. I was sitting in the unit completely by myself on a Saturday because all the active duty people weren't there. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine on like Google Chat, who was uh, someone I had been in a writing group with, who was trying to write books. And I was like, man, you know what I always need to try? Voice acting. And I'm thinking like anime games, cartoons, that kind of thing. He's like, well, my company used to hire stuff for like, you know, unsexy corporate stuff from this website. Why don't you give it a shot? And I was a hobbyist musician, so I had gear, I knew how to produce a recording, I knew how to, to cut things. And I booked the first thing I auditioned for, which again, super typical, is a cartoon panda speaking Arabic to children. Uh, because I had some Arabic knowledge from my Air Force days. And so like, I booked the first thing I auditioned for. It was like, how do I do that again? And it snowballed so fast that within eight months, I talked to my job and I was like, I need to either quit or go part-time. Um, what would you like? And then I went part-time for the next eight months and then quit completely. So it was just like, what I did is I went the brute force method. I started as a home studio guy, so I'm, I was very adapted when the pandemic came. Because um, I had been building my own home studio for, you know, almost... What's your favorite mic? I used a, a Sennheiser MKH 416 for... Wow! Yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, that's kind of like the Anderson standard for promo. No, because it's, it's not a common voice mic. I mean, you, you, you'll come across it in sessions. But it's, it's a boom it, mic. Like, it's a... Yeah. That's what it is. It has this parabolic pattern that comes out. It was used to, you know, to be over out of frame. Mm -hmm. And if you get on the right angle of it, I, I, we both have kind of medium range voices. So it, for me, it yeah, just it's nice. It's so I find it, it doesn't work as well for female voices. I, I prefer them on like a TLM 103, or I have a U87, a normal U87 Ooh. that I use for. Keep that for a little taste. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know they're going to be sitting at dinner later comparing my. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> what did I use? Right? I, I, think I, I think I use a Neumann. I think is what I use. The little one. Yeah. Or the big one. I have. It was a. It's a big one. And I had. Uh, we had moved to. I was born in New Mexico. We moved away from uh, Burbank. We go back there in uh, February of 2020. That's the best time to be moving. Uh, and I always figured, oh, I'll just have a little pause there. I'll record my auditions and I'll fly in LA if I book the And quickly it became clear that I was going to have to build a home studio. And a friend of mine who was an engineer for Disney, I said, what's the absolute? I wanted this done quickly. And he said, here's what you need, blah, 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 blah. And that's, that's the mic that he suggested. You, you know, I have to just share something with you very quickly. I'm, I'm Elderly. I've been around a long, long time. When I when I came to California in the late '60s, I uh, uh, <laughs> I uh, had occasion to run into a guy named Paul Freeze. Oh my! Uh, and and he's this my favorite. My favorite. I mean, ever. I love. Him. And, and by the way, and, and, Paul Freeze, Paul Freeze. And, and by the way, yeah, I will. But this thing we're doing right now, referencing about microphones and other actors. I tell you, it's something that you should be aware of. You should be aware of who we're talking about. I, I'm not giving you an assignment. I'm just saying, if it's in your DNA to be a voice person, then you're like a fan. You're like a, a, a comic con fan. You know, you, you like certain things, and, and you, you collect things, and you should be that way about the voice business. Really try to know as much about everything that you possibly can. So my lesson is Paul Freeze, look him up, about this big, uh, powerful little guy, had one of those handlebar mustaches, and he had a voice like this. He did all of the voices, not some, but all of the voices in the original Disneyland. He was everybody. He's a ghost host. Yep. Welcome, foolish boy. Everything That's down there, Paul the submarine. Uh, but anyway, uh, and he, he kind of took a fancy to me, and, and uh, it was very kind to me and uh, gave me some tips along the way. But uh, the thing that impressed me the most about him, he lived in Tiburon, a very wealthy section of uh, Belvedere, actually, of the Bay Area in San Francisco. And he used to go into his studio in his house. 
and he had a T line, a phone line, and, oh, he, wow. would, and he would send his voice to LA. And yet tell people, say, no, that's not possible. Like ISDN in the 60s. Yeah, but yeah. there was a T line. Ah, but basically, yeah. same thing. And now we do it and don't even think about it. You can, you can make a studio for 500 bucks. Yep. And uh, if you learn some of the software, you can uh, be there with an ISDN equivalent. Uh, what, what's Source that? Connect. Source Connect. Fantastic. You can't tell the difference. But it sounds like you're right in the studio. So uh, collect names. Collect history. It's good. It's good thing to do. Paul Fries, F-R-E-E-S. Who else has got a question? Right there. Go ahead. Sit, sitting in front of Frank Welker for three months. I must have you. I must have you hospitalized. <laughs> Frank Welker is hands down to me. He's God. I did. Uh, Jim Cummings is up there, but uh, but Frank can do things with his vocal cords that defy belief. He used to sit behind me and do Gregory Peck just to make me laugh. <laughs> Jerry, how are you? And I'd fall on the floor. And he just had that, he could push my button. But one of the things that he did that, that, that I, I still devise, devise belief, he did a styrofoam cup of coffee, a pencil punched through the styrofoam, and the coffee leaking out. He did it all in his mouth. <laughs> wow. Everything. So, uh, I mean, he, he takes it into sickness. He really does. <laughs> Frank can, Frank can do anything. And again, another good name to know. When you look him up, you will not believe the voices he's done. W-E-L-K-E-R, Frank Wilkin. And, and to work with him, those, those, were, my, those were my favorite uh, sessions. There you go. I think probably on Avatar, on Samurai Jack, we were very, very rarely were we all together. And the same with Avatar. But on Clone Wars, we almost always, everybody was in the same room. And I think those are my favorite ensemble recordings, and a lot of that was because of Dave Filoni. Uh, usually for animation, that was the producer. Dave yeah. Filoni, yeah, creator, not creator of the show, but big Star Wars guy, George Lucas is. He does a lot now, certainly. And we would go in, and usually uh, for a thirty-minute animated show, you know, they book you for three hours, but generally you're out of there in an hour, mm -hmm. except when Dave Filoni is in. Because he does his homework. I mean, he is literally working encyclopedia of all things Star Wars. And he had, you know, the renderings of every character, and not just the renderings of every character, he would come up to you and talk to you for 20 minutes about your character's backstory. Like, I was playing a very old Jedi named Tara Sunube, and this was his genes. He said, let me explain, okay, Tara Sunube is very old, Craig. Now, he's not as old as Yoda, but we put it this way. When Yoda was a senior, Tara Sunube was a freshman. <laughs> and so, and it would just go on and on. It was like, it was almost you didn't even want to record. You just wanted to hear more about this amazing universe that he would be creating. So, hands down, Clone Wars, favorite ensemble of course. I do, um, I do a show that we're in the fourth season of now called Lego City Adventures on Nickelodeon. It comes on like for SpongeBob. And uh, that was basically, again, I said I'm relatively new in LA. I've only been there for five years. That was my first... Um, network animation that I ever did. And I remember walking into the room for the first day, and it's like, Roger Craig Smith is in there, who's Ezio Auditore, as well as Captain America, and Sonic the Hedgehog. The voice of Johnny Bravo is there, the voice of uh, the Hulk is there, uh, the voice of Dexter from Dexter's Lab is there. Um, and I'm like looking around, I'm like, did you, did you dial the right number when you called me in here? Because like, I am so junior to all these guys. And, uh, those are just my favorite because I will just sit there and learn for four hours. Like Greg said, you know, they book you for four hours, and it depends on how much we all screw around. You, you know, you're either yeah. going to take 30 minutes or you're going to take three and a half hours. And it's just like everybody is riffing off each other, and you didn't understand what talent really was until you sat in front of those people and saw them work uh, actually. like I mean, you get enough of it when, they're, when you watch the end of the show, but when you see them at work, you, you, you don't understand what talent is until you see it. And like I just... It was a privilege to get to learn from all those folks for all the, the episodes I've done. And thank God we're still going, so. It's funny you should mention uh, uh, the voice of Johnny Bravo, Jeff Bennett. 
because I he used to compete against me in high school speech tournaments back in the late That's 70s. Awesome. And Bastard always won. <laughs> so I see him again. I have, funny, I have a funny Jeff Bennett story. Well, actually, I haven't told him this yet, so he probably he hasn't been inside my head here. But the character I do in Lego is his name is Duke, and he has the signature shoulder roll where every time he shoulder rolls, he makes a noise. And in my head, I was like, oh, I'm just basically going to do the Johnny Bravo <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like, but you know, when you do a, a bad impression, it's just a new character. So that's what I basically that said, is the name. right? Yeah, so, exactly so right. Jeff, is, Jeff is in session with me, has been in session with me, and I, I never told him, like, I basically just wrote this from you. Um, and he, his character is doing a shoulder roll in imitation of my character. And the director gets on and is like, hey, can you just do it like Joe does it? Like, oh my god. I'm telling Johnny Bravo to do Johnny Bravo like someone who's not Johnny Bravo. Like, someday I'll get to tell him that. That mental yeah. story. I don't know why they're telling that. You know, that's really not uncommon either. Uh, there was a great story in, when I was in LA. Casey Kasem. Casey Kasem was. Oh yeah. He was a great man. He was he was a wonderful man, and he had a voice like this. Hi, this is Casey Kasem, <laughs> an American top forty, and he syndicated this thing for years and years and years. He was a very wealthy man, and. Uh, but like all working actors, you don't quit working. You get, you have a job. I, I had a series for a while, and I would still take breaks from, you know, whatever you had a break, and run off and do an audition, because you never know when the other one's going to end. And uh, one day to Bell Sound, uh, there was a call. Get over there to Bell Sound. A guy is looking for a, a, a Casey Kasem kind of voice. <laughs> now, this is the kiss of death. When they asked for a Casey Kasem type of voice, a Mike Bell, Mike, remember Mike Bell doing a, a butter? Dark egg, butter. butter. Every year they said, Mike, Mike's going to get fired. And so 10,000 guys would do that voice and then always go back with, uh, with him. But, uh, uh, so where was that? Casey Bell Sound, Casey Kasem. Oh, yeah, so <laughs> Bell Sound. Thank you. Someone's paid attention. <laughs> so this call went out. And Casey walks into the studio. And he's a little guy, you know, bring the mic down for him. The guy on the other side of the glass, some young ad guy says, okay, uh, you want to give me a read? And Casey reads the thing. And he says, okay, uh, actually, we're kind of looking for a Casey Kasem kind of thing. <laughs> and Casey said, I am Casey Kasem. <laughs> and the guy absolutely turned white. He was so embarrassed. So he said, Thank you, Mr. Kaysen. And of course, he didn't cast it. No, he was too embarrassed to do it. And did he keep his job after that? I don't know what happened to the young man, but Casey, you know, it wasn't even a speed bump for him. I want to tell a quick story about uh, doing a Japanese uh, uh, game. Okay, uh, you're talking about this wonderful uh, thing that you're involved in. Uh, I, I was asked to come to a, a, a localization. And localizations basically mean there are existing video games in, from some other country, some other language, a lot of Japanese, and they bring that over here, and then you have to, uh, yeah, you, you do the uh, English voice. And there's a certain skill to it, because you can't, you know, you don't want their mouths moving if yours isn't. So it, 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 it's kind of challenging, but it's fun. And uh, this is my first one. And the Japanese, I love them, man. They are so hierarchical. They have... A guy who's like the sensei, the producer, and then he has a bunch of assistants around, him, all guys, and they're all at his beck and call. And then they would turn and give me a direction, and they said, "Okay, you're going to replace this guy, somebody Mako like, you know, you're going to replace this guy's voice. Before you do it in English, I want you to hear how he sounds in Japanese. He's a warrior." And so I listened to the track, and it was. <laughs> And I thought, okay, that's Bushido, I get that. Watch the, the Funy movies. <laughs> and I did it, and then I said, okay, this next character is a little ancient woman in the village. She's very weak, and, and, and she's very, very frail. I said, well, can I hear the Japanese actor? And so they played it for me, and the voice was, Will you <laughs> 
But that was a great experience. I learned something invaluable about the Japanese. I was in a hurry to leave after the session was over, and I went into the, to the booth and I said, hi guys, thanks, it was so nice working with you. I'm doing a little half bow, I did my card, and they all gave me a card. And I took their cards and put them in my pocket and left. Halfway home, the producer calls me and says, are you out of your mind? I said, what? He said, do you realize what you did? You took their business cards and didn't even look at them. Oh, no. I said, well, I was going to look at them when I get home. No, he said, you don't understand. To the Japanese, that business card is emblematic of their life. That's, that's I mean, everything in, in, in their success story is wrapped up in that business card. And you don't just look at the one, you turn it over. And as you're looking at it, you make eye contact. Wow, great. It's a little lesson about cross-culture uh, brown nosy. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions if anybody has a, in the Okay, I saw three hands go up. We'll try to do all three. We're going to go star in the back. We'll go here and we'll go here. That's the order you raised. So stand up real tall and, and say your piece. Okay. Hello. Um, my, my question is specifically for uh, Mr. Baldwin, but I think you may have had experience in this too. But um, you are in an interesting position in uh, being a successor of a character or previous um, voice actor, uh, was it difficult or emotional trying to or having to live up to that original voice actor? It still is. You know, it, 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 Mako. You know, I think again, it's so. It's, I think it's so amazing that it ends up being me. You know, and usually when you fill in for another role or an actor fire and they hire someone else, you know, the other Darren, as it were. Uh, and all you have to do is worry about the character, trying to sound like the way the character originally sounded. Now, the difference with Mako is I not only need to sound like this iconic character named Iroh, but I have to honor and sound like the iconic character that an actor that voiced him. So it's not only Iroh on my shoulder, but I've got Mako on the other shoulder. And so, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's a heavy responsibility. When we were, uh, it was the next to last Samurai Jack recording session. And I walked into the Cartoon Network and signed in, and I noticed above me someone had written Mako. And I thought, well, that's a sick joke, but what's up with that? You know, I walked back to the dream room, and I'm waiting, and there's, you know, a, a, a Gindy Tartakovsky, the creator of the show, and he says, oh, Greg, I want you to come over and meet somebody. There's a woman there with a teenage son. I said, okay, sure. This is, uh, this is Mako's daughter. And this is his grandson, also named Mako. And I'm going, Who's, I wish you told me this before the session. Because, you know, it's one, it's one thing to just to sound like a character, but no, I have to sound like, I, this is this woman's father we're talking about. This is this is this, this grandfather. This this is a heavy, heavy-duty situation. I'm going, like, you know, I, I hope she's not offended. I hope she likes it, you know. Fortunately, we go into the uh, session, and I'm situated in a session. I cannot see her on the other side of the glass. But Phil Lamar, who plays Samurai Jack, could. And he tells me afterwards that the minute that I started to speak, Mako's daughter just leans back in a chair, just does this. And then when I walked out of the session, very, very worried, you know, she's not gonna like it, she comes up to me, tears in her eyes, and she says, thank you so much, it was like you was in the room with me again. And I think, and, and I couldn't help but think at that time, I get emotional still thinking about myself, because I would give, I, there's nothing I wouldn't give to hear my own father's voice again, even if it was a, 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 an impression of my father's voice, just to hear that, and that I was able to give Mako's daughter that is, I think, the greatest thing I will ever do as a voice actor. Mm -hmm. I, I will ever, ever do <laughs>
The evolution of fandom. Is what you, okay. The evolution of what, please? Fandom. fandom. Oh, it's like interacting with fans. I mean, you know, like like you mentioned, my experience is fairly narrow as opposed to you know, it's like Twitter existed when I started and now. Uh, so, but you know, it's been interesting to see the difference for me um, going from like not being well known to being well known and how that has like uh, progressed. Um, but ultimately, like, the you talked about connection with fandom. That has been my favorite part. Like, I get to see a ton of different perspectives from people that I don't interact with in everyday life. I've learned a ton from fans about like what it is to be in somebody else's shoes. Uh, I think it's really kind of like widened my perspective of what it means to be human, like all the stories we tell each other. Um, so that's that's kind of my experience with. With fandoms, just getting to know so many people, even on like the micro scale for 10 seconds at a table, I, I get to know a little piece of everybody's story, and that's really, really magical. Very great. You guys want to address that a little? Um, go ahead, Greg. Oh, back to you. Uh, fandom, fandom, fandom. I, I, I need to think a little bit more on that. Just to give me a, give me a brief moment. I, for me, sorry, I got it. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I, I, I agree with Joe. Uh, the, the cons, and I'm so glad that we're back, even with our masks on. It's so nice to be back in the room. And that to me, before, especially with Iroh, Iroh was a great character. I didn't realize what an impactful character he was until I started meeting people. And people would talk about it. And it's like, and not only that, you get to go to interesting places, you get to meet interesting people. It is. By far and away, my my favorite part is the gig, actually, and I think I think that uh, I hope that the cons and the fandom that is going to grow larger. I mean, I think Avatar is certainly starting to approach uh, Star Wars Marvel levels uh, in the in the in the, the amount of fandom. I mean, I, I think it's not out of the question that we might eventually see Avatar cons simply sure. devoted to Avatar: The Last Airbender. Uh, anyway, knock mm -hmm. like on wood. Uh, how do I get on? That? How do you get on Avatar? Yeah. Well, the, the show went in 15 years ago, so... Uh, Again, <laughs> day late in the dollar store. <laughs> however, however, Avatar Studios, Nickelodeon starting Avatar Studios, which is dedicated to simply producing Avatar content. Wow. So, hey, may not, you know, might have another show. In L.A. In L.A., yeah. And, and there's, there's another thing to, to come back around to, how do I get into this business? Uh, it's not going to happen in Stockton. Lovely city, nice place. It's just not going to happen here. It's not going to happen in, uh, in San Francisco, really. Uh, you've got to be in the thick of it. You've got to have an agent who is constantly sending you out because th there's so much work in LA that the odds are in your favor. See what I mean? And you're playing a numbers game. So if you get to do a thousand auditions, you're going to you're going to come away with the uh, having landed some. And the thing about the fans and dealing with fans, I agree with Greg about uh, the effect that fans can have on you when you're not prepared for it. You do a session. I, I, DuckTales, that's 30 years ago. I mean, I've sort of forgotten about it. I have forgotten the song. The theme song is in my head forever. Oh, I know. It's <laughs> the best. It's the best. But when you're sitting there, you're writing a, a, an autograph to somebody, and this one big guy came to me. I think it was in Louisville or someplace. And he came up to me, giant of a man, young guy. And he said, I just want, very soft spoken, he said, I just want to thank you. I said, I did, what went for? What did I do? And he said, uh, you were the one, you guys were the one escape I had as a kid because I was big and awkward and everybody thought I was stupid and they picked on me. I said, you were, you were a victim of bullying? He said, oh, it was terrible. It just, you know, I, I would be crying almost uh, every day after school. But he would run home and watch DuckTales. And when you look at it through, through his lens, you understand psychologically what that meant for him. It just, it just took his mind off, off his troubles and, and gave him some escape. And that, that's the beautiful thing about what we do. And I, sometimes we lose sight of it. Clearly, Greg has it. But uh, uh, I admit to having 
lost sight of it until I started doing comic cons. And people say, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it makes all the difference in the world. You know, it really does, actually, face to face. And it was nice doing the panels virtually, because at least it was a way of keeping all this alive. But I, yeah, cons are like nothing else in the world. I, I, there is a radical sort of freedom that exists only at cons, where you are free to be whoever you are. You know, and no one's going to pay any attention. You know, whatever outlandish costume, and it even, frankly, it even extends to me. Like a lot of actors, I am by nature rather insecure. I'm very, very shy. At a party, I'm probably not going to talk to you. But at my table, I'll fuck your arm off. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I'm next to him. Believe me. Well, on that, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to it because we're out of time. We got to clear the room. But. I guarantee you, if you go up to their booths and ask them the question, they will answer, hey, right? You hey, promise? Plus, can I have 10 seconds? You're not the, well, I was going to say, 10 seconds to closing words. words no, just this words. has nothing to do with any of the stuff we're talking about. And, and so, but I have to plug it, okay? Because that sweet lady over there, my girlfriend, Katya, say hi, Katya. We do, we do a podcast that came out of the pandemic. Uh, she and I and a third friend. Uh, when we couldn't see each other, we just you know, got on Zoom and, and did a podcast. And we would we were put a lot of effort into it. So I'm going to give it a, a cheap plug. And would you please check it out and hit subscribe? <laughs> okay? It, it's a vicious competitive business. Especially when you're, when you're not getting paid. <laughs> but if you could look at that, just eyeball it and give us a, a, a hit. It's called Three Homies. The number three, H O M B E Y S dot com. Everybody's writing it down. Okay, good. Uh, but if you do, if you just peek at it, and it, it, I mean, there won't be a waste of time to get to at least to see Katya. And uh, I'd appreciate it if you do it. Okay? Thank you. Well, you can follow me on Twitter, and then you might unfollow me on Twitter very quickly, depending on what sort of mood I'm in that day. Uh, but I'm also Aku, so I can be a little salty from time to time, certainly on Twitter. Uh, coming up on October 1st on Disney Channel and Disney Plus and Disney Platforms, The Ghost and Molly McGee. I'm a regular on that show, and uh, I hope you watch it. The Ghost and Molly McGee. What is that You know what? They have not dropped my character. So I'm not going to tell you. I, they know, you know, I get it, but I, no one said who I'm playing, and so I won't tell you who I'm playing. Except that maybe I'm playing a ghost thing for I follow me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty much the only Joe Z out there. So. <laughs> and you have a cool website. I do have a cool website. I, I, like, I like your website. Yeah, I stream, so you can find me on Twitch, on YouTube. I do all like the cool, trying to my best to pretend I'm a millennial kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, really, Joe Z is not hard to, to find me. Let me ask you guys something. You're big Twitter people? Sure. Unfortunately. <laughs> Five years ago, uh, Telltale asked me if I would be interested in doing Inspector Gordon for their Batman. I said, well, of course, we're crazy. So I had done a number of shows there. And, uh, and a new guy took over. And I, you know, I, sent, I sent my audition, and everybody was real excited. That's perfect. That's the right book. And I didn't get it. And the reason I didn't get it was because I had no Twitter following. Yeah, social media has kind of become a part, but of, be, part, of, the cast, part of the cast. Be aware of this. Yeah. You have to be aware of this. I've been in the business 50 years. I didn't get cast because I don't have a Twitter follower. That's unfortunate. It's, it's a new world. True. Be brave. Yeah, scary world. Can I get a huge round of applause? Thank you for coming, everybody.